Required listening with Amazon Music. Dad music again? The greatest guitarist of all time. Wait, who? Alexa, add this song to a new playlist. Sure, what's the new playlist name? Jack's intro to classic rock. Adding Stepping Stone by Jimi Hendrix to Jack's intro to classic rock playlist. Amazon Music, the simplest way to listen to the music you and soon he will love. New customers start your 30-day free trial at AmazonMusic.com. Renews automatically, cancel anytime. Here we go. Dollars Bigfoot Radio. I'm doing fine. How are you doing, Lauren? Fantastic. <laughs> it is finally warming up here, and, uh, and we, me and the, the family today, we went out and uh, hiked around and kind of, you know, checked out some places around here because it's finally nice enough to do so. So that was fun. Yeah, it does. That was nice. Yeah, Sounds nice. Was. Did you find any places that were squatch worthy? Um, I don't. This place may have been squatch worthy, but uh, there were so many people there that I didn't get the vibe. My squatchy senses were not tingling. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, well, but, yeah. hopefully next week it'll be of, squatch tastic. Exactly. Just want to let everybody know that we are not having a show next weekend. Lauren and I are hitting the woods. We're going to go squatching up in Oklahoma. So uh, we're really excited. This is a a notorious hot spot. So uh, it's been a long time since I've been there, probably about 14 years. I hope it still is. So, but it's beautiful and we need it. Mother's Day weekend, we're going to put our feet up during the day, and we're going to do some squatching at night. It just sounds awesome. So um, also to let you know that uh, after that, we'll be having one more show, and that's the last show of the season, and we'll be back, I think it's September 2nd. But anyway, we do have one more show coming up, so I'm ready. I'm ready for us. Um. Uh, Yes, it's been, it's been uh, you know, quite interesting, you know, working and, and Lauren works and she's also going to college and so it's been extremely busy for her. So we're anxious to take a break. We sure are. So I we hope do, y'all uh, can. Yeah, we do appreciate all of our listeners, um, your patience with mm-hmm. us, you know, on weeks that stuff comes up or a guest falls through. Um you know, we, like, like Lori said, we both work full time and, um, Mm -hmm. you know, have our, our busy little lives. This show means a ton to us though. Um, so we continue to try to put on the best show that we can. Um, but we do appreciate your support and your patience with us. And, um, here's hoping next season is, you know, just as good as this one, if not better, um, Uh a whole new, uh, crew of, researchers to interview and you know get on here so yeah there's there's a lot of them out there too uh quite a (laughs) few of them and i'm going to be contacting them over the summer and try to get them lined up um what was i gonna say uh oh i apologize to everyone that is listening to this show on blog talk our guest is dan lindham 
not days. <laughs> and you see, this happens towards the end of the season. I just get uh, just rag tagged out. So uh, anyway, he is. Uh, we've had Dan on before, and uh, but it's been a while, and he's had a lot of stuff going on, and I really wanted to have him back one more time before the hiatus, the summer hiatus. So we've got him on tonight. Lauren, do you have anything else to share? No, ma'am. Hopefully we'll have a lot of interesting things to talk about when we come back from our um, expedition. So um, I think I think we will. So, yes. uh, so anyway, cross your fingers, um, everybody. Send good squatchy vibes our way. <laughs> yes, please. We're ready for some action. I'll go ahead and let you introduce our guest, Lauren, and I'm going to sit back and let you take the wheel. All right. Okay, so tonight we have Dave Lindholm. Dave, Dan, dang it, you did this to me. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Dan Lindholm. How are you, Dan? I'm doing great. If I call you Still by damn. the right name, you'll probably answer, right? <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm reading this, and I, I know, I know your name, but you know, it's just it's stuck now. Okay, anyway, so, uh, <laughs> so what have you been up to since you have been on the show last? And I know you said you went squatching recently, so you're still in the field, and that's good. Yeah, um, boy, I've got so much going on. <laughs> Excuse me, holy crap! Um, God, where do I start? When when I last time I was on the show with you guys, I had just written a book, correct? I think so. I think yes. I was working on my second book, maybe. Mhm. I think. Anyway, I finished my second book, and um, so now they're both available on Amazon and Kindle. Um, awesome. The Wild Boy of Kentucky is a uh, an awesome story that um, was actually relayed to me by a guy on his deathbed, and he told me told me the story. He wanted the story to get out before he he had terminal a terminal illness, and um, I received this entire story via text message, run on sentences and just um, oh my gosh! It was a, like it was. A, I don't have a problem taking credit for writing the book. Let's put it that way. Because right. I had to decipher it and, and make sense of it, and I still tried my dangest to get across his exact message that he was trying to say. Mm-hmm. So I tried to, as much as possible, I tried to use his exact words and phrasing. And um, it's an incredible story of a, a young boy who befriends a, a young Sasquatch. And um, it... The, re- the relationship goes on for years, and um, he tells lots of great details, and um, there's there's questions that are answered in this book, and he, he swore to me that it was all real and all true. Now, with anything, you got to take it with a grain of salt, you know, because there's some things in there that might be a little hard to believe, but he mm-hmm. swore they were true, and um, it's just, it's, it's really, I mean, it's a real short book. You know, don't get me wrong, it's not a novel or anything. Mm-hmm. And I didn't, he stopped. He told me that he was going to send me a whole nother part of the story. And he ended up dying before he could do that. Oh, gosh. So the story went on, I think, um, it's hard to recall without going and grabbing the book and looking in there, but I'm not going to do that. I think it was 1967 to 1974. And what I got in the book only runs through till about 1970. So you're still missing some years of, of the relationship they had. So, um, but it's just, it's a, it's a pretty incredible book. It sounds and, uh, that way. I mean, it's, it, it, it sucks that he passed away before he could, you know, get you any more detail, but um, it sounds, you know, you're lucky that you got what you got and, um, were able to get that down, and he was able to get that off his chest. You know, that's amazing. Yeah, and I mean, I and I, I feel like it's it's my service to humanity or whatever I mean, to get his story out. You know what I mean? 
And I mean, I'm not trying to be grandiose or nothing, but you know, I'm just, I'm. It's just that there was, that was what he wanted, was to get his story heard. You know, because he'd been holding it in his whole life since he was just a little kid, and now he's, you know, was in his 60s. You know, and, and he died. So, um, pretty special. You know, I feel very honored that he chose me to tell his story. And um, what had happened was he he told little tidbits of his story on, um, I think it was like Bigfoot Community Page or something like that, or group. And then I contacted him and I just said, man, you know, can you do a sit down with Ed Brown, you know, interview? I didn't know he was sick or anything, you know what I mean? And he said, yeah, sure. And then I didn't hear from him, didn't hear from him, didn't hear from him. And then it was like months later, maybe four or five months, and he texted me and said that he was really sorry that he hadn't been able to do the interview, that his voice was gone, and he was waiting for his voice to come back, and that he was going to be unable to do it because his voice never came back. And then he asked if I would help him tell his story, and then the next thing you know, I'm getting (laughs) just, you wouldn't believe the the text messages, the stream of text messages, you know. Yeah. It turned into, you know, 80 pages in print or whatever it is. It's pretty, it's amazing, um, pretty wild. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so that was your first book. Uh, tell us a little bit about your second book. Well, my second book is my own stories and stories of um, friends and acquaintances when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. And... Um, See, when I was pretty young, I was I was only 18 when I had my my first real experience. So then, when I, for the most part I kept it quiet, didn't say anything to anybody. I didn't go like public or anything like that at all. But in certain situations, when you get a group of people together, we'd get on the subject, and I'd tell my story, and other people would tell stories back. So I collected up these stories. There's some pretty dang good stories, and my. And my initial encounter is in there as well. And um, you can catch it on the Big, on the Big Truth YouTube channel. I, I did it. It's um, in my Northern California Sasquatch video series. And um, it's number six, Pinnacle Rock. And that was my original story. But then I also wrote it in the book in greater detail. I tried with all of the stories, I tried my best to try to give more detail and and um, elaborate a little more than, you know, that, than on my little video series on YouTube. So um, it's a little more in-depth. And, um, I mean, just as an example, there was this one guy who was, uh, he was like, I'm, I'm not saying he was a, uh, I, he, was, he was some kind of criminal or something. He wasn't like, a, like your regular average Joe guy. He came out of, I think, Stockton or Modesto, California, out of the gang scene. He was like an old style gangster. And um, I met this guy and he was a little older at the time and he kind of got out of that life. But when he was in that life, he and two other friends were both on the lam. They all knew they had warrants from the law and they all jumped in the truck. You know, they grabbed a bunch of supplies and they planned to go all winter long up in the mountains and just hide out until everything cooled off and they could come back and hopefully be able to go back to having a life without the cops looking for them. So um, they go out in the mountains of Northern California on the coastal range, probably only, you know, 60, 80 miles in from the coast, if that, maybe only 40 miles or something from the coast. Um, And he told me whereabouts, kind of near the town of Garberville, but in a really remote location. They went way, 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 way out on this, on this, like, fire road until they came to a fence like way out there like 20 miles away from the main road or a gate so they stopped at the gate and they packed up all their stuff and they started walking in so as they're walking in they were hearing they were hearing footsteps and hearing things in the woods and and they really got scared they were they all got that feeling of being watched and they went by this little creek and they saw these these big old footprints, and they were like kind of freaking out. But you know, now they're out there. They're they're committed to do this. So they're you know, and they're already probably 10 miles from the truck or whatever. So they find a spot to camp, 
and they set up they set up their camp and everything. It's getting dark out. And they keep hearing these things out in the woods. They're hearing whoops, and um, you know they're get, they're real nervous. Let's <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> so it's it's just getting dark, and they decided to go ahead and go to bed for the night because you know they're all really tired. They just had a long hike and set up camp and all that. So the three of them get in this tent. And he said, shortly after they got in the tent, they started hearing more and more and more noise outside. And they were hearing stomping. They were hearing, like, branches being beat on the ground. And they heard their their stuff getting all rooted through and messed with. And said it just kept building and building and building. And they were whooping and hollering. And it, he said it sounded like there was a hundred of them out there at one point. Now this is not this is what he said. Okay, I'm not exaggerating his words. And he said that he thinks it, it might be like a breeding area in the winter time for them or something, because they were like there was they were everywhere. And their t- their tent was untouched, but these guys none of them slept a wink. Of course, they, they were scared to death. He said right about the time the sun started coming up quieted down and they went out and, and they started checking out the situation after you know after a while <laughs> they still laid there for a couple hours they got up everything in their camp was completely destroyed he said the therm the, the the cooler deal was in little pieces and there was there was big branches and stuff laying around you could see where they'd been beating the ground and he said there was just footprints on top of footprints on top of footprints all around their camp. Everything was totally destroyed except for that tent. Oh my gosh. And needless to say, they got the heck out of there. And they, they walked yeah. out and they, they decided not to stay up there all winter. Oh my this is, gosh. These are tough guys, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, well, that was probably smart to, you know, get out of Dodge for sure. Uh, yeah. That's that's an example of one of the stories in my book. It's, it's there's some pretty oh. good stories. Yeah. You know, um, so I can tell you another one. It's kind of short. Oh, that's uh, fine. Yeah. Is that all right? Mm-hmm. Go for it. Okay. So there's this there's this one homestead in Lakeport, California. Like back way back in the early '60s and back in the '50s, it was back up in there where there's there's no. Uh, no freeway or anything at the time where the freeway is now out back behind town and there was just like a bunch of haulers and oak forest and they had this cabin back up in there and this kid was oh about 16 years old and him and his friend decided to stay the night there and they had this little outbuilding out past out behind the house and there was these windows cut in the wood on the side of the little building you know like nine holes cut they were or six holes or something, but they were like nine feet high, these holes. It was way up on top, right at the top of this shed thing. So these guys are sleeping at night, and this kid wakes up, and he just has this feeling of mortal fear, and he looks up, and there was something bent down looking in. And this is like nine feet high. Something's bending down looking in at him. And he couldn't say a word. He was freaked out, and he finally, like, hit his friend and his friend woke up what what and it, and it took off and walked away and but his friend actually saw it too right when he woke up as, right before it turned and walked away and they were just you know kids they were scared to death so at this same homestead when this kid got a few years older now he's a senior in high school and it's prom night okay his parents and his whole rest of his family was somewhere else they were you know at a powwow or something they, they left town but they stayed there because of the prom. So he was there with his girlfriend at the house. And there was a little footbridge. Or there's a parking lot, and then there's a little creek that ran across the property. And there was a little footbridge that went across the creek, and then it went to the house. So the cars were actually on the other side of the little creek. And so they're getting ready to go to the dance, and he goes out just to start up the car and warm it up. And he walks out the front door, and he hears this scream, like a blood-curdling scream. And he was scared to death. And it was on the other side of the creek, out past the cars. 
and he was just like, okay, I'm going to go back inside, and hopefully whatever that was will leave. So, you know, he waits another five, ten minutes, and then he tries to go out again, and he goes outside, and he heard it again, and now it's dark out, and now the scream is on this side of the creek, closer to the house, between him and the cars. And he runs in, slams the door behind him, and his girlfriend's standing there looking at him like, what? And then he had told, he didn't, he just said, go close all the doors and windows. Lock them all up. She goes, what, what? Just close them. Just lock them. And they went around, and they closed all the doors and windows, and they, just, and they sat there, and they could hear this thing walking around the house for like a couple hours, walking just, <sighs> they could hear it breathing big deep breaths and then eventually it left but they were they were, they were scared to death just, and they didn't even have a phone at their house so after the dance got over their friends came over because they were wondering how come they didn't come to the, the dance you know the big prom or whatever and um, so they came over and they, they came inside and they stayed the night and then the next morning all of them went outside and sure enough, they found these big old footprints walking all around the house. They found these big hairs. So <laughs> that was a pretty good one. And prom, I mean, that's a, that's a. It would take a lot to keep a teenager from making their prom. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, that's like the highest priority for most teens. So, uh, or at least you know, back in that day, especially. But. Um, Wow, that's amazing. I mean, that sounds like a good book and a good collection of stories. Um, so if you'll reiterate one more time where people can find those. Um, you can find my books on Amazon and Kindle stores. Um, that's pretty much the only place you can find them. You can buy the, the hard copy on Amazon or, you know, the digital copy on Kindle. And if you buy okay. a hard copy, then you get the digital copy free, and they're really cheap. Really cheap. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's been. Have you signed up with BookBub? Um, they'll they BookBub. If you sign up with BookBub, they send out uh, books to your email stuff they think you'll like, and it's like you know two ninety nine or ninety nine cents or whatever. They'll send it out, and then you can go through and get cheap books like that. Anyway, I know a lot of authors. Um, who have signed up with them to get their book out there to the masses, you know, a little bit cheaper, but still it goes to a lot more people. So um, it's pretty, it's a good little program. Um, so if you will cover one more time um, your, what got you into this whole thing, what got you into Sasquatch? Okay. Well, like I said, when I was 18, I had my big sighting, and that's the one that I documented in the book and on video. But, um, you know, I, I had an interest before that, you know, to be honest, just because of, like, in search of and stuff. But it was just like a passing interest, just curiosity. You know, but um, when I was 18, fresh out of high school, just a few months out, I believe it was August of 1986. See, I'm an old-timer. And... um <laughs> But uh, my buddy and I, were. there was a spot where all the kids used to hang out in this town of Upper Lake in Northern California, um, you know, uh, by Clear Lake, the big lake, Clear Lake, in Lake County. And anyway, we, we were just hanging out there waiting for somebody to come around or something, you know, so we could BS or whatever. And um, this guy, Les, pulls up in his Jeep. And this guy, Les, is kind of crazy. Me and him went rattlesnake hunting it's, he's that he's that guy that reaches in the, the holes and grabs a rattlesnake and pulls him out oh my God. I know a couple <laughs> he's of those crazy. <laughs> and so you know for a while he had been driving his jeep around with only one headlight and now he pulls up and he tells us he's going up to pinnacle rock and he has these two girls with him and he asked if we wanted to go and i'm we're like yeah and he said but we can't we got to stay the night because i don't have any headlights at all so we can't drive. we got to stay up there. So we're like, um, yeah, let's go. <laughs> you know, we were just kids. I mean, we didn't even think about uh, blankets or anything. 
you know, we're wearing like shorts and tank or t-shirts or tank tops or whatever because it's August, right? So we go up on the mountain, and um, so we we get up to Pinnacle Rock, and like I said, there was two girls, two one um one I went to school with and I knew really well, and the other one I didn't know at all. She went to a different school, so we get there, and we pull up at the bottom of the. The, when you get to Pinnacle Rock, there's like a hill, and there's like a parking down below the rock, and you got to walk up the hill before you can actually walk up the rock. And if you keep going down the road right there where the parking is, if you keep going down that road, it goes only, you know, maybe another 100 yards at the most, and it just stops like a cliff. And I'd been out there before, and it's a cool view too, and I was like, you guys – let's go out here real quick and check out this view and then we'll go up to the big rock. And everybody else was just anxious to get up to the the great view on top of Pinnacle Rock. So everybody was like, no, no, we're just going to go up here. Come on. And I was like, no, I want to go down here. So I went by myself down the road. And, I, you know, I'm only, I'm not very far at all from the car. And I started getting this feeling of being watched like, like crazy. And at the time I didn't know, I didn't, you know, I didn't realize that, that's like a marker that you got to watch out for. <laughs> and I just dealt with it. I just kept going. And so I just thought in my head, I was thinking that one of those guys must be messing with me or something. They're probably back there behind me when I walked out there. So I walk out there and I'm looking at this killer view off the end of this cliff. And man, I had that feeling of being watched like crazy. And I just knew that somebody was trying to sneak up on me or something. So I got myself all loaded up and ready, and I just spun around really super fast. And when I spun around, something, I'm guesstimate, six foot tall <laughs> with brown, long brown hair, just disappeared behind the bush. It was over right on the left side of the road, like it was standing there looking, and right when I spun around, it it bailed. And just like every time somebody sees a Sasquatch, the first thing you think is bear, or you try to put it in a box somehow. Right. That's what I did. I, I immediately did not think Sasquatch at all. I thought bear. And it was kind of odd, you know, the, the way it moved and the height and, and even the hair. Everything was off for a bear, but it was still so quick that I was, I was able to justify that in my mind that it must have been a bear. So I walked straight back to the rock, and, I mean, I'm walking fast. I was, <laughs> I was practically running back that 100 yards back to the rock, and I could, man, that feeling was so intense. The hair was standing up on the back of my neck, something, something watching me. And it was all the way, there's like stairs up the side of the rock when you go up it, and as I was going up those stairs, everything, until I got up on the very top with my people, uh, I was terrified. I mean, this was, it was that feeling, it was almost, you know, disabling. It was, it's a, such a strong feeling of um, being in danger and being watched. And, um, I mean, honestly, every time I'd ever been up there, and this, this was probably the 20th time I'd been up to Pinnacle Rock, but every time I'd been up to that place, when you're walking up the stairs, you got that eerie feeling every time. And there happens to be an old cave at the bottom of the rock. I heard they sealed it off now, but there's a cave down there where you can go. You could go inside and drop down into this little chamber, and you were about you know six feet below the, the little hole that you had to scooch down in to get in. And um, it opened up into a little chamber, and then it went down into a big chamber. And I heard that that... That cave system used to go all the way down to the lake. Well, I mean, they had it they had it dug way back in the day, like for mining or something. I'm not sure exactly what, but anyway, there's a there's a cave system going on, and it's all closed off down at the lake. And I believe they closed it off on top now. But anyway, the, just a side note: there's another story in my book about Pinnacle Rock and, and inside that little cave that's also terrifying. <laughs> but anyway, okay, I get back up to the rock. And I tell him, I'm like, I think I just saw a bear. That was the first thing I said, you know. Unless he says, he says, was it a monkey man? 
and me and and my friend Michael and the two girls, we were all just laughing, like, yeah, right, the monkey man, are you kidding? He's like, no, really, you know, Bigfoot. Like, I go, no, I'm sure it, it had to have been a bear, man. There's no way. And he's all, no, they, and he started telling us stories. He's all, no, they, they, they whoop at you. And he had spent a lot of time out in the woods around there. And he told you that, told us that, you know, they throw pine cones and they throw rocks and, and they whoop and, you know, and he's seen them several times. He's all, they're totally real. And we were all just laughing, thinking he was making it up the whole time. Okay, now all of us, the, the four of us besides Les, we're all facing Clear Lake down, down, and there's a huge, a great view of Clear Lake and Mount Kanawha and just beautiful. Les was sitting opposite us so that we could all talk, and behind us, Les sees something. He jumps up, and he's all, did you see that? And he runs back to the back of Pinnacle Rock behind us, and we're turning around, and we're all like, no, see what? He's all, there was a little one right there. He just peeked his head up and looked at us. And, and he got to the other end of the rock, and he looked down. And he's all, he, he, goes, he goes, I just saw it. I just saw it down there. It scurried around the rock, and it was going around the corner down there below. This is like sheer, sheer cliff, straight up and down. And this thing was just scurried right down the, the side of this thing. And we were laughing our heads off, honestly. We thought he was so full of it, right? I mean... You know, we're just kids. We're up there, and it, we already know this guy's crazy. And then we get up there, and he starts telling us these stories. You know, and then he's the only one that sees this one. And we're like, come on, Les. <laughs> you know, quit quit pulling our chain. Quit, you know, messing with us. And he swore that it was real. He's all, I swear I saw it. I swear it was right there. It was a little one, and it took off down the rock. And right about that time, it wasn't very long after at all, we hear this racket going down the mountain behind the rock. And like I say, it's sheer, and it's probably, you know, 50, 60 feet at least of sheer cliff, and then it's just like a shale mountainside that's really steep. There's all this shale rock everywhere. So something made a racket going down that hill over that shale. So then we're like, what in the heck was that? And we it it sounded like it went about halfway down the mountain and stopped. So we started we started grabbing these big rocks, <laughs> big rocks like you know twenty thirty forty pound rocks, and started hucking them down this hill. And we could hear it hitting the shale and rolling all the way down the hill. It sounded really similar, but then all of a sudden it would go bam like hit a tree, or. We had a couple that rolled and rolled and rolled and rolled and rolled and rolled and rolled, 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 rolled all the way to the bottom. But whatever went down that hill, after he supposedly saw the little one, didn't roll all the way to the bottom and it didn't hit a tree. So that, that was just kind of interesting. So then, you know, now we've been now we've been throwing big rocks. So um, now it's starting to get dark, and. Um, we we still weren't none the wiser. None of us. We we thought Les was full of it. And uh, so me and Les are sitting there. We collect up a bunch of wood. All of us go out and collect wood. And we come back. And Les and I are sitting there with a the lighter trying to start this fire. You know, both of us with our head right down in it. And all of a sudden we hear this thump. And we look up. And this big, big rock rolls right at our feet. It landed about 10 feet from us and it rolled right at us. Right, right, like within a foot from my foot. And this rock is about a 40-pound rock, you know, like a, a foot and a half by a foot egg of granite. And it just came out of nowhere. And I was like, it, that, it, that must have fallen off the rock, off, off the pinnacle rock. And, and Les is all, no, there's no way. If it fell off the rock, it would be way up. Because we're way down the hill from the rock at this point. <laughs> we're down close to the Jeep in the parking area. So we're not, we're not right under the rock by any means. We're, we're a little ways away. And I just, that I couldn't explain it. He, he couldn't explain it. And he kept saying, it's the monkey man. He threw a freaking rock. We're just like, no, no way, man. No way. So we're, so then we get the fire going. And we're just a bunch of happy kids sitting around the fire telling stories. And all of a sudden Les goes, Ow! Was quit throwing rocks, 
And again, we all just started laughing. We're like, dude, give me a break. You don't know. I just got hit by a, a little rock. And we're like, no, you didn't. <laughs> Come on, Les. <laughs> and he's all, no, I swear, I just got hit by a rock. And he's all, bear, ow. No, I said, quit throwing freaking rocks. He didn't say freaking. And uh, <laughs> so we're like, what? Les is just and having a bad just, time, isn't he? <laughs> yeah. And we're like, Les, you're, you got to stop. <laughs> You got to quit doing this, Les. And then my friend Michael got hit by a rock. And he was like, ow! He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. He's like running around in circles going, oh, my God. (laughs) And then all of a sudden we all kind of believed Les, and we're like, holy crap. So Michael picks up a rock and throws it back over in the bushes. And then more rocks started coming from the bushes. And this is not... An exaggeration, Les and Michael sat there and had a rock fight with the bushes for probably 45 minutes. I mean, oh, I, I wanted cool. it to end. <laughs> and while this is happening, all of a sudden, Les is like, oh, I seen it. Did you see it? And Mike's like, yeah, I saw it, too. And they saw one of them. Said it, was, it, looked like a, it looked like a young one. And we're like, yeah, that's right on, guys. I'm sitting here talking to girls, you know. I'm I'm a young guy with young guy's libido. I'm <laughs> talking to the girls. I didn't even give a dang about them. You know, I, th- I still thought it was a bunch of tomfoolery. I'm like, come on, you guys, grow up. <laughs> so, <laughs> then all of a sudden, Michael turns and runs like half sideways, half forward. His, his feet were all crossed up, and he's almost falling, and he's yelling, twins, twins. And we're like, what? And, and Les is all, yeah, I saw them too. They're twins. And they saw what looked like the same one they had seen. Right on the other side of the bushes from that one, like a couple bushes away, they saw them both throwing rocks at the same time. Two twins. They said they looked like about 12 years old. Oh, my and gosh. Like, and now we're, like, kind of freaking out. And we can't leave because we got no flash or no uh, headlights. And it didn't have a flashlight. And I'm like, man, I will carry that flashlight down the road in front of the Jeep. Let's just go. We got to go, you know. And um, he wasn't having none of it. He's like, no. And then, you know, he grabs the flashlight and, and turns it on, and, and it started doing that thing like flashlights used to do where it totally dimmed. And then he hit it, and it got a little brighter, and then it dimmed again. So next thing we knew, we didn't have a flashlight at all. And uh, so we're stuck. We're stuck. And then we're sitting here around the fire, and Les, again, I don't know why he was the crux of the story. It's like every single piece of this story had to do with Les. I don't know why. But Les, because he's a crazy guy probably, but he goes and kicks the fire to try to, like, like um, you know, rouse it up and, and get the coals up. So he kicks the fire and throws off all this light. And right when he did that, Susan, this girl that I knew from school, and I were sitting next to each other, and we could both see this huge Bigfoot about 30 feet away standing next to this tree looking at us. And I'm talking eight foot tall, four feet wide, the the whole works. This is a big guy. Oh, my gosh. Totally big guy. And I couldn't tell you what color it was because it was by the firelight. I'm sure you can imagine it's just like it's just lit mm-hmm. up, just a dark something that was lit up. And I couldn't even give you details about you know, like what it looked like below the waist or anything. It was like standing there, but all eyes, I just focused straight on the face because that's what people do. Look right. I looked right in his eyes, and it opened his mouth like a oh, and it just went in a flash, bam, right behind the tree. And the fire went down right at that same time. So we saw it for like maybe two seconds, but it was the longest two seconds of my life. I, it, it's just burned in my memory, the, that face. Yes. And, oh, man, big old guy. What was your reaction? She was like, well, she reacted first, and she's like, oh, my God, what's that? And I was like, you know, I was like, oh, my God, I see it too. You know, I mean, it was like, <laughs> holy crap. And I hadn't seen, besides when I first got there and I thought it was a bear, I personally hadn't seen anything yet. Susan hadn't seen anything yet. Les and Michael had both seen the little ones, 
Les supposedly saw one little one, you know, before that. And the other girl that was with us, with all that action going on for hours, she never saw a Sasquatch. She never saw one. That right there, with such a crazy event, with so much going on, um, that right there speaks to how well they hide and how, how hard it is to actually have a sighting. You know, yes. you would have thought that would have been the time. <laughs> if, if you were with us, you would have been golden. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. that's not necessarily mm-hmm. true. And I'm sure there's a lot of sightings like that where there's multiple people, but only one or two people see, you know. And uh, I'm sure I that happens it, all the time. I think it's very fortunate for them to be looking in the right place at the right time. And Oh, that's a huge it, it point. Is, yes, because I, I, I know that all, on all of my sightings, I was by myself except for one actually had a witness with me but other than that it was just me and it's very hard to tell people that there wasn't anyone else that saw it well at least your friend saw it also so yeah uh, right and there were several things that occurred that were you know verified by other people Mm -hmm. and then i'll tell you what then it was time to go to sleep time to go to bed and Les has, Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, and he has a blanket and two sleeping bags. So we decided that we're – Les decided he was just going to get and go with the blanket and the Jeep, and all of us tried to squeeze into the two sleeping bags, the other four of us, and it just wasn't working. <laughs> so Michael gets up and gets all frustrated, gets up and goes over to the Jeep, and he had to share the blanket in the front seat of the Jeep with Les. And I guess it paid off that I did all that talking to the girls earlier because I got, yeah. got to sleep in the sleep bag. <laughs> but anyway, I'll tell you what. I don't know if I got any sleep at all, at all. Well, there, I kept hearing these big old footsteps, like walking on, on both sides of the, the camp. You know, I told you it's like a straight up the hill to the rock from the parking lot. So mm-hmm. like through that area, there was nothing but on either side of us in the woods. God, I'm hearing these all night. And I'm just scared to death. And get up in the morning, and, you know, no sleep, all dazed, still in total denial, trying to – and I was trying to tell myself that I must have seen some kind of wild man or something because – I'll get back to the description, but it was a little little more human-looking than most. So it really threw me off. And then I get up in the morning, and I say, man, did you – we must have had some elk walking around or something. Did you hear those footsteps? And Les is like, it was the monkey man. Don't you remember? And, and then it was like everything kind of cascaded back to me, and it was like there was no way to deny <laughs> what what had happened. And I couldn't I couldn't put it in a box like a bear or anything like that anymore. And I'll tell you what, driving down that hill, as soon as the, there was enough light, it was like 5:30 in the morning. <laughs> we're driving down that mountain with just barely any light, and uh, we got the heck out of there, and we were all looking back the whole time. Nobody said a word. We were all just, like, in shock of what, what happened, what we went through. It was, it was like, it was akin to, like, being in a war or something where you're stuck in a yes. really bad situation, and you can't get out, and there's nowhere to go. Nothing to do, and it just kept – I mean, I wanted those rocks to stop so bad. You know, those guys were having a blast throwing rocks back and forth with them, but me being an observer and not being part of that, I was not caught in the heat of the moment. I wanted it to stop, you know, and after that going on and then the, the footsteps, and it was just like, when will this ever end? Please, please let us live through this. So, I mean, it was really, really traumatic, I'm telling you. And then Les, you know, about, it was probably a couple months later, you know, Les comes up to me at this big party, and he's all, hey, there's Dan, hey, Dan. He was telling somebody about it, you know, and he's all, you remember the monkey man? Remember right there, Pinnacle Rock, all that crazy stuff that happened? And I was like, yeah, yeah, and I just walked away, walked out, walked into the other room. It was like, (laughs) I did not want the bullseye on my back. I did not want everybody to be you know, asking me about it. Um, it was, back then, it was a lot different. Now, it's it's 
absolutely believable now because there's so yes. much information out there. You can find so much online. Anybody who's interested in the subject, it won't take long before they're a believer. And they go, yeah, this has got to be real, right? But back then, it was super-duper fringe. It was yes, only it was. crazy people say these things that, you know, and um, well, even it was even in 2000 when I first got into this, I, it was still. I think it was finding Bigfoot coming out, and after several seasons, people finally started warming up to the idea that Bigfoot could exist. But prior to right. that, it was like, you know, if you said, "Well, I chase Bigfoot," they all just <laughs> they just fell out and pointed at you and. Mm, it wasn't pretty. Yeah. So. And you still get that a little bit on the news reports, but not nearly as bad as mm-hmm. it used to be. It used to be a running joke. Whenever there was a Bigfoot story, it was a big joke. Every single time. It wasn't like just once in a while it was a joke. <laughs> now we've come right. to a point where I've seen some serious reporting on Bigfoot, and that's pretty neat, you know, that their their actual news organizations are taking it a little more serious, you know. And... um. I think that that's where we're headed. Um, it's only a matter of time before somebody gets the, the new Patterson Gimlin film. I mean, seriously, yeah. it's it's way past time. But with the digital revolution, what we did was we took a couple steps back with um, when we started with using a bunch of camera phones, four megapixel, eight megapixel, and um, it became blob squatch heaven at that point because things start to look like other things when you're only looking at that mm-hmm. kind of resolution. Now we're getting to the point where everybody's carrying around a 21 megapixel or 18 megapixel on their phone. It's just, it's, it's days better quality. You can actually see now what there, what is there. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I honestly, I know that because I myself have got, had a lot more blob squatches show up in my pictures when I was using the 8 megapixel camera. Okay, and now that I'm using a good camera, now not only do I get way less blob squatches, which says a lot about people who claim they, they have blob squatches, but when I do see something, there's better detail and you can actually make it out a little bit and then it, it's actually more impressive. <laughs> And it really is, and then I can feel like it's really something. And it's not so much of a question. But as this gets better, people are going to end up with just phone with an awesome camera on it. And when they see a Bigfoot, bam, somebody's going to get one on film. But I think wherever their people are, they still hide. So you're going to get either very far away one moving or if one is close it's just going to be in and amongst the foliage you know and then it's like people will say oh that's just a shadow um i know i see a lot of pictures and a lot of red circles and and i'm and i've even had people take a regular picture that i took and they'll send it to me in a message with all these red circles all around me. And I know I was standing right there, and there was not any Sasquatch right next to me. It was a bush. Yeah, like, um, it was a bush. No, I'm it pretty was... sure there was not 50 of them because I was right there. Uh-uh. Yes, <laughs> it's broad daylight, broad daylight. And, um, yeah, that... <laughs> Okay, I, I, I don't even respond because I don't know what to say to them. Um, what I don't even want to ask them what it is they've got circled because it could be little people, it could be anything nowadays, anything nowadays. Um, your research area is uh, the Sky Lakes Wilderness area, and, yeah. and is that in the mountains? Uh, it sounds like it is. Yes, it is. It's right. It's it's right at the crest of the Cascades in Southern Oregon, between Medford and Klamath Falls, uh, right by the High Lake Summit, and it's just north of there, and it's adjacent to Crater Lake Park. 
it would be just south of Crater Lake National Park. So between Crater Lake National Park and the Sky Lakes National Wilderness Area, you're talking literally, I don't, I don't even know, it's hundreds of thousands of acres. It's a huge area of and it's either forest, managed, is, is managed that national park or wilderness. Where, yeah, there's no access in the wilderness area except for just trails, you know, hiking or, uh-huh. or horse. Oh, wow. And it's so in the you and Ed area. hike in, hike into this area. You're not able to drive in. Nope, I can only drive to the the. I might be giving out too much information here, but I can only drive well, to the south you, end yeah, of just the lake. Be, there, be careful. that's where the camp Don't ground wanna, is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and basically, the lake's a good uh, at least three miles to the other end, to the north end. And wow. that north end is where I have all my action. So you're going to have to hike okay. and go there. You're going to have to hike three, four, or five miles one direction to get into where I've been going. Now, this year, wow. I got I got a little trick up my sleeve. I bought me a boat, and I'm going to be <laughs> driving that three miles instead of hiking that three miles, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then go from there. And we're going to be able to cover so much more area. And we're going to be oh, able to yeah. really study the areas that I know they're they're present, you know, very well. And um, we have a, we have an ambitious game cam program going. And I know everybody's going game cams don't work, game cams don't work. Well, we're going to try something <laughs> a little true. different. I'm not going mm-hmm. to just do what everybody else has done. That would be silly, right? So, <laughs> I mean. Uh, I should save this because it's going to be in my dang movie and it's going to be one of the big points. But I'll tell you what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it difficult and, and in fact, impossible for them to observe us deploying the camera for one thing. And for another, the cameras are going to be set up in a location where they're not at eye level strapped to a tree. I see. So that's just without giving it all so away. So you're going to... Obviously, you're going to have some kind of distraction. And um, I'm just, we're going to absolutely cover ourselves when we deploy the camps. Uh-huh. So there is no I possibility see. of being seen. Now, yeah. I've had so much interaction out there, so many rocks thrown and stuff. I kind of hope that that technique is going to actually draw them in because they're going to wonder what the heck we're doing under that blanket. <laughs> yeah. You know, if they are out there. But the whole idea is to get rocks thrown at you, because if you really think about it, that's the only thing that they do or that's going on out there that you cannot somehow attribute to nature. Bears don't throw rocks. That's a fact. Nothing else throws rocks. And when you know that there's no people at all and you're having rocks thrown at you, that's a pretty dang good indication that you're not alone. <laughs> so I would agree that's... completely. What do you hear vocals out there, and have you found track? What other things have you found that could be like um, co- co- corroborating? That's not the that's word. A great, I can't. Great point. Because mm-hmm. I will tell anybody that is going to you know post something on the internet and say, "Check this out. This is awesome." So I was quite built this. One thing: How do you know? <laughs> But yeah. for another, you've got to have corroborating evidence. You have to have corroborating evidence in order for your stuff to be considered legitimate by by the real researchers out there. Mm-hmm. Now, that's what I've got going for me out here. I've had we, – we heard one day we were walking down a trail, my, my friend Daniel and I, and we hear a growl off to our left. So we turn and we walk straight towards the growl and crack. We turn around and look and a tree comes down straight at us, but we were, we were about, you know, 200 feet away and it was a hundred foot tree. So it was aimed right at us against the wind. I have to ask you, was this at night? No. Or during the day? During the day, about two o'clock in the afternoon, I think. Oh my goodness. And we hear this crack. And the trees fall, and we t- we turn around and we see this tree coming down, and as it's falling, we can hear something doing a big arch running through the brush, made a big arch around us. 
and as the tree's falling, and then after the tree hit the ground, we could still hear running around over to our right. It ran around us. Oh. What in the heck? <laughs> this is getting into the distraction. They do distraction. That's what they do. That's what rocks are all about when they're throwing rocks at you. You're probably about mm-hmm. ready to walk up on the family or one of yeah. them. And from a different direction, one's going to throw a rock to try to distract you. So that's totally what you do with rocks, I think. And I think so, I, too. I love, it. I love the rocks. And, you know, I we have used to, We on. used to research and, and have have them making all kinds of noise on one side when actually the most of them were on the other side. You know, they you would right. have one over here making all the rackets so that everybody is paying attention to that side when actually they're traveling through on the other side. But yes, uh, go ahead. I, I, I keep interrupting you, but I, oh, I'm okay. just excited about what you're talking about because I know I mean, that I'm, you're right. We, we can hit on so many subjects, you know, I just... I'm just going along. We can just keep on changing the subject. That's fine with me because I, I just got so much stuff inside me I want to get out. <laughs> well, I was also going to say, uh, it being right there on the lake, uh, I found all kinds of evidence right around the lake where I was re- where I research at. and it Because they do go to the lake for water. They go to the lake to catch fish. They... Uh, go there to cool off, and and I have found a lot of, uh, I found butt marks where it had sat yeah, the down. Yeah, the best trackway, the best trackway mm-hmm. I ever found was right, just right on the beach, just right up up the beach from the lake, and yeah. it was walking parallel to the shore, and it was about 16 inch prints, and they were far enough apart that I took my, the biggest step I could, and I couldn't couldn't get quite there, and I'm six foot wow. two. So, um, well, just with that it was big. boat, that's going to be amazing. You're going to be able to get into little coves and places that people don't oh, heck yeah. really, only a fisherman goes into. And yep. Where they're and I just I plan on covering that whole end of the lake. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna oh, we're gonna be there for 11 right. days at the beginning of June. It's 11 days in a row. I've never spent that much time out there, you know. It's usually a day trip or something, and I've had all this activity. Uh-huh. So I imagine 11 days going out there in the in the brush every single day. I'm hoping to get enough used to us that maybe we'll see one or something. I mean, you never know. Yeah. You know, and, and well, we're going to be filming didn't it for you, our next documentary. Didn't you see one? Didn't you see one last summer? Did you say in the yes, same area? Yeah. Yeah, we were there last last summer. Big Truth Productions. We teamed up with Lundy Street Productions, and um, a guy by the name of Mark Pierce from uh, down in Southern California. He came up and spent the week with us up here in my area, and we filmed. It's a movie called Here Be Giants, and it's mostly okay. Mark's story. And it was the the 50th anniversary of the Patterson Gimlin film. You know, and um. He's, he made the trek up through the redwoods and um, visited Bluff Creek, and you know he's there. We're a part of this documentary. We're not like the focus of it. But when we were there, um, when Ed and I, Ed Brown, we first got there, we were there a couple days ahead of before Mark got there, and um, we got there and we started setting up camp. And I mean, we'd only been there for like a half hour, maybe 45 minutes. And we're sitting there with, there's like this one picnic table. At this, it's like a horse camp, they call it. And there's a big pond, mm-hmm. like a feeder pond or, you know, so that you can give your horses water. And then there's um, one one little, you know, outdoor bathroom. And there's, they're not even like official camping spots, but there's just like spots around a big circle where you can actually camp. And uh, so we could pull up in there next to this pond. And there's one picnic table kind of by that pond. So we're sitting there. We got the best spot. We're the only ones there. Or actually, we weren't the only ones there. There was an old couple that was on the other side of the campground from us, and they were the only ones there. And they were drinking or something. They were hooping and hollering, making a bunch of noise. And the guy over there, he yelled. And when he yelled, he he did some kind of holler or something. And it echoed off of the bank of that little pond. It was real steep on the other side. It went up maybe 12, 15 feet. And... 
him yelling on the, you know, down on the other end of the pond, but it echoed off of that wall, and it sounded like he was across the pond. So I'm sitting at this table, and I just look straight across the pond where the sound came from, and I look just in time to see this thing take off walking. And I mean, I could see it like from the from the knees up, <laughs> about a nine foot tall sucker. And um, there's there's trees along the bank, right up above the bank there, kind of not not super thick, but they're not really spread out. And then behind those trees, there's opportunity for more camping and stuff back in there. So it was kind of cleared out a little bit. So between these trees, it was probably about six six to eight foot gap between these trees, where I saw this thing just walk across really fast. And then I'm like looking over there, and I'm looking, and it walked. It has a paddy walk. It wasn't like a person walking. It was, it was yeah. different. It was it, it it struck me as strange, and it was all dark from head to toe, and it walks across there. And then I'm looking, waiting to see it come out on the other end, down towards the other people's camp. You know, I could still there's other spots where you can see through those trees. I never saw nothing, and I'm like, what in the heck just happened? And where we're at, okay, that other couple is there, but um, we're like a couple miles off of the main access road right there on this little dirt road way out in the middle of nowhere. Like the chances of it that it actually was a person are null. You know, uh-huh. There would be no reason for somebody to just be hiking by right there. <laughs> it just didn't make any sense. But, and it didn't look like a person, but I will tell you what, my brain tried so hard to tell me it was a person. Uh-huh. I'm, telling you, I'm out there making a movie about Bigfoot. You know, that's why we're there. <laughs> we're looking for Bigfoot. And I couldn't <laughs> come to grips with the fact that I just saw one. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 incredible. It's, it's they play a Jedi mind trick on you or something. I don't know what the heck. Uh-huh. But I'm telling you, it's like you 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 will insist on putting it in that box. And I don't care. You know, I spend a really good amount of my time thinking about Bigfoot and what Bigfoot does and how I can counter that. I mean, I spend an incredible amount of time, more than probably anybody, <laughs> thinking about Bigfoot. Uh-huh. And I still couldn't, couldn't, I couldn't. I couldn't cross that X and, and make it a Bigfoot. You know what I mean? I mean, uh-huh. I think I did because Ed says, you saw a Bigfoot. <laughs> you know? Because I'm like, I, I just don't know. He's like, yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it was? And I do know what it was. And then the so did Ed was see it? Did Ed see the Ed, one you saw or you the only no, one that no. saw it? I mean. Nope. I was the only one that saw it. Okay. okay. And I told Ed about it. So then it was maybe a half hour after my sighting. We go around the pond over there. We grab our cameras and everything. We go over there. I figured there's got to be some footprints or something, you know, if I saw something. And we go over there, and it's your typical Oregon forest pool, or it's just pine needles everywhere, and there's no freaking tracks anywhere to be found. Uh-huh. It's like <laughs> they, they really, really – it's really hard to find tracks in my area. <laughs> but yeah, so same, we go down – here. We just, we just – bail off of that this this campground sits like on the top of this mountain and it's it's not like a steep mountain it's got you know nice rounded sides so we go down the side over there back behind where i saw it and we go back in there and we're poking around for a little while just seeing if we can find any stick structures or anything and we saw a couple kind of interesting things but nothing that really struck us as you know amazing or anything we turned around and we started walking back up the hill and all of a sudden ed saw one or saw something and he said, whoa, you know, I just, and I was hearing something at the same time, and I didn't catch it on camera, and he didn't catch it on camera, but I did catch him catching it with his eyes on the audio of my camera. <laughs> wow. A different direction, you know. But he's like, whoa, what was that? I said, he's all, I, he said, though, the best way I can describe it is it sound, it, it looked almost like a bear walking upright. And what he saw was like, from the from the middle of the head back, you didn't see the, a face. You saw like the back of the head and the back of the back of it as it went by this tree or behind this tree, and it was right in the sunlight right there. And he saw like brown hair, 
on this thing right in the sunlight. And but he he said it had like a hunched back, and that's why he likened it to kind of like a bear. But it didn't look right. He said it didn't really look like a bear, but that was the closest thing he could describe it as. And then of course you know he's looking and looking and looking, and we we walked straight up there where he thought he saw it, and but no nothing. We didn't see anything. You know, if it was a bear, I think I, we probably would have seen it. Exactly. So, and it wasn't a really super, super duper thick area either. You know, the woods a little bit spread out right in there. I mean, I, I'm sure we would have seen it if a bear would have run off. It was just, it was really odd. So yeah, I think we both saw one within like a half an hour of each other, right there when we first got there before we even started filming. <laughs> I mean, it was pretty incredible. <laughs> That's amazing. Especially I've got when I think I got to walk. You know, I think I got to walk yeah. four miles to find them, and, and they're right there at our camp, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. You know, I had an experience one time. This was like high noon, and um, I wasn't expecting to see one. I was in a campground, and, of course, the, it was on a Monday, and the campground had emptied out. You know, we were like probably the only people still there, maybe a few other campers. But there was just, you know, we were packing up and everything. And I'd looked over towards the bathrooms. I just was sitting down taking a break. You know how you get hot packing everything up. And I was sitting on the picnic table, and I looked over towards the bathrooms, and I saw one come into view and it was doing kind of like the pink panther like he's sneaking but he just kind of went over to behind the tree and he was tall and dark and he wasn't very big he was maybe six foot tall and he was dark and uh, from head to toe he was jet black and then I watched him go to the next tree over to the next tree, and then he did it again dee, 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 to the third tree. Well, I jumped off the table and started walking towards him, and he was probably 50 feet away, maybe 60, and maybe a little more. I'm not good at, you know, feet. But anyway, I saw him go behind that tree, and there wasn't any more trees the bathrooms was the next thing he would be heading to so I just went straight for that tree and I never took my eye off that tree and I walked straight to that tree when I got to that tree he wasn't behind it well there was a road right there in front of the bathroom and right across the road it was real grown up real tall grass and I saw the grass moving so he literally stayed in the Behind that tree, as he crossed the road, he stayed behind the tree in my view. You know, all I could see was the tree. I never saw him. He stayed behind that tree, made sure he he had the tree covering him as he crossed the road and ventured off into that tall grass. Because I could still see the grass moving. Wow. That's amazing. And it just makes so much sense. yeah. They're very, very, very smart, and and um, they're they're um, strategic. The word I'm looking exactly. for. Exactly. Very strategic. It was just like you saw it. You saw it cross that first clearing, but it probably knew you saw it, and and it didn't want to come back out again. So instead of going back across that next clearing. Instead, it went yeah. straight back. Once it got out of sight, it went straight back. And exactly. Kid, you know, that's oh, wow. They're they are amazing creatures. Yeah, what do you think absolutely. they are? I mean, I mean, do you have an idea what you think they are? Are they? Do, or do you yeah, think honestly, there's a monkey that's man? That's what I'm or trying to you, find out. I I. You know, honestly, I think there's there's several types. And there is like a straight up monkey man and that's probably the most genetically pure Bigfoot, whatever, you know, from back in the mm-hmm. day. I think out here in the Pacific Northwest, I think a whole lot of them, probably most of them, if not all of them, 
have interbred with humans along the way. They mm-hmm. seem to look a lot more like uh, like Native Americans in, the, in their facial features and that. And, um, you know, then the skunk ape, that's a whole different thing. Hell and, yeah. And, um, but I don't, I don't know that it's so much a different thing as it is just um, they're, they're tall, skinny, lanky. They, uh, it's uh-huh. the southern climate. You know, you got, you got yeah. Canada, they're going to be huge, like, just like a bear. And then down south, uh-huh. they're, they're, they're skinny little bears, right? And that's because, exactly. because you're down south and it's hot. They don't need to store all that fat. You know, uh-uh. and so I think Sasquatch is totally the same. We're down south, and you know, like even in Louisiana, they talk about average heights being closer to like six or seven feet instead of like nine feet out here. You know, uh-huh. and I think it has to do with the the it does have to do with the climate, and it just goes right in line with large mammals around the world. You know, it's it's not at all like out of bounds of science to think that, right? And the same thing in Southern right. California. Out there in the desert, they've got these dang wild men out in the desert, and they're tall, skinny, lanky guys because they don't need all that he- heftiness. No, they don't. So it's a, no. But I also think that um, there could be there could be some that are um, related to an ancestor that was more like a baboon, honestly. And um, I think that there are... Bigfoots with snouts, especially like around, yes. you know, Tennessee, Kentucky, that uh-huh. kind of area of the country. I believe that there are Bigfoots with snouts, and I think that that is a lot of what people think is a dog man. Now, that's a whole other thing. I agree with it you. We, actually be, but we... You know, um, I, I, I always got to take everything with a grain of salt and can't speak in absolutes, but uh-huh. it, it does make sense. To, to think that instead of a whole other species of dogman or werewolf, that we're actually looking at a, a different type of a Bigfoot. Yes. To, to me, it makes more sense. I, I'm, maybe I'm totally off. I agree. I, well, the, the one that I saw, it looked just like Bigfoot, except that its, its nose was protruding out, almost like a baboon. And yeah, I and saw I've it seen briefly. Artist conditions like that. It's, mm-hmm. it's and and <laughs> everyone says, well, where's its ears? And I said, well, I didn't see any ears. There weren't any protrusions on top of its head. It just had like a regular head, but it had a, a boxy protrusion in front of its face, kind of like a, like a baboon. Wow. And, That's um, amazing. Also, up up north of here, around the um, Little Cypress River, which is up near Marshall, Texas, there's been sightings of the snout of Bigfoot in that area. So I think that um, it's more common than you think in the south. And, and of course, you know, they have the Luguru and all that, you know, and I wonder if that's actually not a dog man but a snouty bigfoot and I uh, so I, I i don't know it, it's like you say i'm wondering if they are even the same thing um it's just I mean, like I mean, well I mean, I, I not to get off the somebody... subject but look at all the different alien descriptions there are out there. You know, there's the gray yeah. ones and this one, you know. And then, uh, so, you know, they may not even be physically related, biologically related. Right. And I heard this, this one guy said that he, he was familiar with a whole family of them, and they were practically all different. One of them was all dark wow. with hair all over its face. You know, one of them had light hair with uh, hardly any hair at all on its face. You know, um, I think one of them had a snout. It's like I think their their biological diversity is like just off the hook. I mean, just crazy. Well, that is and wow. If, if you wow. think about our diversity, the humans' diversity, and then you mix that with a whole different species that's probably diverse too, and you can see where it would just go crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We got 
we got three toad suckers walking around out there. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I've actually found two toad tracks, two big toes on the end. Wow. And uh, it, it it and there were two feet. Yes, I had the, both the right and left. And wow. it was just so weird. I kept that cast for a long time, and then I said, well, there's no way. So I just got rid yeah. of it. Yeah. But, but it, again, you know, science, answers, science answers these questions. I mean, you will get yeah. two, three toes, four toes with lack of genetic diversity. When you've got That's a lot of true. inbreeding going on, that kind of thing happens. So, you yeah. know, like a, a whole lot of things in Sasquatch are explained by science. You know, they really are. And, um, man, we need somebody to put it all together. <laughs> There's something yeah. there. <laughs> but it's just such a, it's so, it's like the longer that you're in it, the less you seem to know. I, that's the way I feel. Yeah. Cause I've been doing it for 18 years. You've been doing it for longer and don't you feel like sometimes that you just don't know anything? Because when yeah, when someone comes you know, up to you and go, well, what what are they? And after eighteen you know, years, you ought to know what they are, but you don't. And and it, case case in point, you have your very best day ever, very a very specific time of year. You can't get there the next year at the same time. You go back two years later virtually the same exact conditions and you think you 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 got them now they're bound to be there and nothing they're not there uh-huh. and it's like um you can't it's very 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 hard to try to predict from year to year where they're going to be what they're going to do you think you can exactly. that's that's where everybody starts when they go from year to year to year re- researching you know you know mm-hmm. that you found you had all this great luck in this area so you want to go back there and you try to make it the same timing and everything, and it just, like you said, you the know they you were it, in the blackberries in March. You know they were in those blackberries because they left evidence of being there, and you think you'll catch them there next year because they're surely going to come back for these blackberries again, but they don't. Exactly, and, and I mean, I, I, it's very, it seems very, very hard to predict what they're going to do, and that's that's probably one of their strengths. You know. Gosh, we're about running out of time, aren't we? Yes, we are. I think we have maybe <laughs> ten minutes left. Or I don't know. Let me look. I was laying on the bed talking to you. <laughs> I'm a lazy host. Oh my goodness! Let me see what time it is here. We have thirteen minutes. All right. Well, I want to give everybody a heads up. I thought Big Truth was doing two movies this year. But we're actually going to do three. We just did like wow. a really rush, put together job, and Mr. Ed Brown is going to direct a documentary about the JFK assassination called JFK Truth Be Told. He's going to be filming that here in about a week and a half, two weeks down in Dallas. Oh, I and, can't um, wait to see that. I'm a huge computer. I, 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 I think that, yeah. I'm interested in that. And Ed is a super big fan of that conspiracy theory, you know, and his brother Uh is like a world-class historian. He can tell you the name of uh, a taxi cab driver, whatever, anything (laughs) that had to do with that case, he can tell you. I mean, so it's going to be really good and really interesting, and um, I'm looking forward to that, too. What about the other two movies? What are y'all doing? Okay. So... I'm gonna I'm gonna do a documentary. It's gonna be my my project here in my area. That that first eleven days in June is gonna be the start of it. And we're gonna deploy the cameras like we talked about. Then we're gonna go back and spend about a week in September and go back and retrieve all our cameras. So they're gonna be out there for about three months, which is gonna be really cool. Oh, and um, yes. I'm gonna throw all of that together along with the history of the place, the history of everything that I've that happened there and to kind of, you know, give a full round view of what's going on. And it's going to be called the bigger truth, big truth, the bigger truth. And that's, that's a name I've been holding on to wanting to do, you know, can we use it for a podcast? Can we use it for this year? I'm going to use it for this movie because this might be 
my uh, Guns N' Roses appetite for destruction. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> if, if I never yeah. do anything else in my career, this might might show the best evidence from me. And um, I'm really hoping we get a bunch of interaction and everything. But in the meantime, I've still got all the history of the place to, to make this movie. And it's going to be good. I'm also writing Are you going to put out any kind of baiting or are you going to bait or put out any food? Um, we are thinking about doing a little gifting station, actually. Yeah, okay. And, and try it out. I'm not, I've never really done it, but we're going to try that. Okay. So then, so that's that movie. <laughs> and um, our third movie is going to be a feature film, a horror thriller called Forest Dark. And it was written by Steve Shaky Peck. I don't know if you know him, but he's a, uh-uh. he's a guy that's been floating around the Bigfoot community. Shaky, and um, he wrote the story, and Ed Brown turned the story into a screenplay, and Ed is going to direct it, and we're going to be filming in West Virginia in the middle of July, and um, we've got, we've got like, I think eight people that have actual credits in movies, we have actual actors uh-huh. for a movie, it's, it's, we're not just getting a bunch of lame-ass actors off the street, excuse my language, so uh-huh. it's, it's going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dangerous uh-huh. story, and um, Ed and I have invested some money, and we we got this equipment, you know, this really nice camera and audio equipment, so we can start uh-huh. making these movies. And basically, the whole thing about Big Truth has always been about Bigfoot, you know. And uh-huh. I want to make these, I want to make these documentaries up in my area. I want to show people what's going on, and that's kind of my mission with Big Truth. And Ed. Ed is kind of taking a different path, and he's gonna he's gonna be the the features division guy, and he's gonna try to make us some money so we can finance our Bigfoot research, basically. Oh, that's awesome! So you know we're we're really we've really taken a leap of faith, and I we got a whole bunch of money invested, and um, this is like a make or break year for Big Truth, and we're just gonna we're just going for it. We're gonna try to do this and um, try to get our head above water so that we can. Keep on showing people what's going on out in the woods. That is great. That sounds exciting, too. I can't imagine staying out. The longest I've ever stayed out was probably four days, and it was like sub zero. It was so cold. Um, That last, that fifth. That fifth day, I said, I've got to go to a motel and warm my butt up. It never unthawed the whole time we were there. And I I just wanted a hot bath to sit in and unthaw my butt. It was just so cold. But uh, that's the longest I've ever stayed out. Have you ever stayed out for 11 days? Nope. You know, I've been out there for, I think it was was six days last year. We stayed out there in a row. You're gonna be a wild man when you come back. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be a blast. Wow. I can't wait. Yeah. You know, we've got some special guests coming, a couple people coming up and visiting us and um you know, uh Claudia Ackley, the woman that's suing the state of California to prove that Sasquatch mm-hmm. exists. I'm sure you're familiar with that yes. story. Yes, yes. She's gonna come yes. up. She's gonna come up and spend a couple of days with us out in the field. And um and of course Ed'll be there and um you know, I've got some local folks around here that are gonna come and and uh I'm hoping that my buddy from Idaho will be able to make it. A really good friend from years back. And if he does, he's gonna be the skeptical guy. You know, he kinda of humors <laughs> me. I gotta have one of those. Yeah, he doesn't really he doesn't really think it's for real, but he like I say, he humors me. And, you know, what I want to get on film is him saying, oh, my God, this is for real, you know? <laughs> uh-huh, yes. So, so we'll see how that goes. But one way or another, it's always a good day out in the woods, so it's going to be a blast for sure. Sounds like it. Well, Dan, I want to thank you so much for coming on our show again and updating us. Is there anything else you want to share? We've just got about five minutes left. Oh gosh, I don't know. I guess you can you can always keep up to date by um checking out the the Big Truth page on Facebook. 
which is like a news mm-hmm. page. I post post news from all over the net, like every day, on there. And um, then we've got the Big Truth blog, where you can catch um, award-winning author Scott Harper's series about all the 50 states and the early Sasquatch reports. We're up to number 19, so we're about halfway there. So if your state is one of the first 19, you can already check it out on our bigtruthblog.blogspot.com. And um, it's a great series. It's really cool. And um, other than that, just keep, you know, if you watch the Big Truth YouTube and keep up to date on the Big Truth Facebook page. And, well, we've got, we've got a page for the Forest Dark. We've got a page for the JFK, um, Truth Be Known, and um, Truth Be Told. Excuse me. So you can find those on Facebook. And, um, yeah, that's probably the best way to connect with Big Truth is on Facebook. And um, the, our mission is just to keep keep reality, keep keep the truth coming, and um, try to present evidence to show people that this is a real phenomenon. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. And we wish you the best of luck on your documentary this summer. And I I really hope that you you get you get the money shot. That would be just would amazing. Be it it really amazing. would. Well, I'm going to be crossing my fingers for you <laughs> so that you do. If anybody deserves to get it, it's you. And you're doing a great oh, job you. out there. And and uh, thank you so much for coming on our show. Well, thank you very and much guess, for wanting me. Well, we wanted you back on. And I guess we're going to try to get you in September or October and see how things went. I don't know. All right. You may be busy putting the documentary together, but I'd like to have you no, come there's back. always time. There's always time for Night Caller's Bigfoot Radio. <laughs> I saw Give us a plug there. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of that, we're going to go ahead and tell everyone good night. Sorry we're going to miss you next weekend. We thank you for listening to Night Caller's Bigfoot Radio. But we're going to have a blast. We'll tell you all all about it when we come back the following Sunday. So, uh, everyone, have a great night, and we'll talk to you all later. Everyone say good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Introducing McDonald's new one, two, three dollar menu with breakfast favorites for one, two, or three dollars, like the sausage McGriddles, small McCafe espresso drinks, the sausage McMuffin with egg, and a new gaming console for my son. Uh, no, but the one, two, three dollar menu could help you save for one. Wait, isn't your son five months old? Who told you? I just know these things. Oh, build whatever meal you want with favorites on McDonald's new one, two, three dollar menu. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal. Introducing McDonald's new one, two, three dollar menu with breakfast favorites for one, two, or three dollars, like the sausage McGriddles, small McCafe espresso drinks, the sausage McMuffin with egg, and a new gaming console for my son. Uh, no, but the one, two, three dollar menu could help you save for one. Wait, isn't your son five months old? Who told you? I just know these things. Oh, build whatever meal you want with favorites on McDonald's new one, two, three dollar menu. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal.